Smart cities are moving into every aspect of our lives for one very important reason, we live in cities. So over the course of the next hour, our panel will explore how we can create smart cities, the issues that, it, that, that arise with smart cities, and most crucially, what's stopping us from going further with them. I think it's about not what a smart city is, but what it could be. You put the word smart in front of anything, and I think it gives endless possibilities. I think technologies come and go, but great cities are around forever. There's no doubt that the connectivity and some of the examples we're already seeing in certain cities in the U.S. and across the globe are really showing why we're doing it. We're doing it actually to give access to things like healthcare, to energy, to lots of other different services that a city might offer. As you think about the last 20 or 30 years and the productivity miracle that has truly transpired, there's probably a couple places in, in uh, society broadly around the globe that has somehow escaped the productivity miracle in the last 20 or 30 years. I would say city governments are right at the top of the list, right? And uh, there has been little to enhance productivity of city governments and how people interact with their cities and their governments. But connected cities are just a huge key element of this. And I think this is where we're headed. And as we get these cities connected, then all of a sudden the productivity miracle that everybody else has experienced begins to manifest itself in government. I think the point here is that cities have to start small. They need to think big, but start small. It'll become contagious. Kathy's right, we, we have our own version of this, so several of them actually. We have a number of cities that we've identified around the U.S. that it's, let's get started. Classic example is uh, Atlanta for us. You have these commuter routes that are just getting jammed and you're trying to figure out if you're a city planner, what can I do about these jammed up commuter routes that doesn't involve having to build another highway or something? So what we give them are traffic patterns. What's happening? Where, where are these, what's feeding into these commuter routes? And then what can you do in terms of traffic signaling? What can you do in terms of uh, traffic management to, to free up these commuter routes so I don't have to build big highways? So we're giving them this data and they're actually able to begin to change the traffic flow in Atlanta. Now think about the implications on, at scale, not just one commuter route, but at scale to energy consumption and productivity of your citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Good example right now is Columbus, Ohio. Columbus won a, go a federal government DOT grant in the U.S. for about 40 million. That got tapped off by 10 million from a philanthropic organization, and now private sector has added 100 million. You're either extracting money from the citizenry to make these investments, or you find some way to create what I like to call economic gravity. How can you create economic gravity where there are the right incentives for this infrastructure, for these services, for these applications that Carlos is speaking of? Where, how do you create economic gravity? This is going to be harder than we all think to get this, all, all the, just within a, the city government, let alone outside all the departments. So I think that's an impediment. But I think that we have to look at the incentive side of this. For a city who is going to be successful around this, there's a huge upside. There's proven economic benefit. There's access. There's pulling people out of poverty. There's a lot of benefits to this. So hopefully the balance of outweighing these impediments, clearly ROI is always going to be an impediment as we think about investing in these type of things as governments do. You've got to have the infrastructure layer. Without the infrastructure layer, forget it. This doesn't go anywhere. But once the infrastructure layer is in place, as you begin to think about traffic management, as you begin to think about healthcare that Carlos has, has discussed here and how, how you change healthcare and interacting with city governments, suddenly you have privacy policies that are not inconsequential. We have to do more in terms of involving the citizen. The citizen today looks at this idea of smart city and thinks it's something of the future something that they really don't grasp. And so you have to get these examples to scale them up so people see it. And then you have the involvement of the citizen. And so when you get out of this room, you go in the street and people really want it. And that's what politicians need. And so far, I'm not feeling yet uh, in a lot of countries that buy-in of the citizen because the citizen doesn't get it. 
here's where I think what's happening in the U.S. is really, really critical, and that is you want to be a part of this City X or City Y. Here are the standards, and you have to be compliant with these standards, and interoperability is one of those key requirements. There's no sensible city or smart city, as we call it, uh, without that open data. And that open data is the basis for everything that we're talking here. Radically drop the cost of governing our communities, our states, and our municipalities. Radically drop the cost and improve the effectiveness of police force, fire departments, first responders, and so forth. If you're not in this ecosystem, find your place. No one company can do it alone, no one government, no one city can do it alone. If you don't live in a connected car, city, or home today, or nation, you will soon. So, you know, as a, as a company and as business leaders and community leaders, we have got to get this right. And we can't take five to ten years. This has got to be over the next two to three years.